Eindhoven Engine is heavily involved in Dutch Technology Week and one of the hot topics at the moment is the growing global interest in smart mobility. Not only self-driving cars, which is still some way off, but also driver-assisted systems starting to appear on the market for safer navigation in both cars and trucks. Eindhoven University of Technology is leading the way in many respects. So let's cross to Gijs Dobbelman to find out more about what they're up to. Here's a video introduction made before COVID interrupted everything. This car is used by the University of Eindhoven to research self-driving vehicle technology. And mainly the technology that allows the car to perceive the environment around it. Just as we humans, we need to see other people, cyclists, cars, where the road is. The same holds for these self-driving vehicles. And the self-driving vehicle uses sensors, mainly cameras, radar and LiDAR. And what we research are the algorithms or the artificial intelligence that interprets the sensor data to form a so-called world model, a digital world model that represents the world around us. Guys, hello. Uh, great to be in contact. Uh, that's a very impressive room you're sitting in. Where exactly are you? Thanks, Jonathan. I'm here in the, our lab of the Eindhoven engine uh, in Eindhoven on the campus of Eindhoven University of Technology. And uh, this is we, where we do our research. So we just saw that clip and some of the more general work that you're involved in. That's quite old. Maybe you can bring us up to date. Yeah, indeed, that, that video is already quite quite some years ago and technology is progressing very fast. So uh, um, what we're currently doing uh, together with one of our partners here in the Eindhoven engine, that is NXP Semiconductors, we are researching the next generation of advanced driver assistance systems. And at the virtual CES in the USA uh, earlier this year, they talk about what they call blue box technology. What's the connection uh, with your Eindhoven engine project called Smart Mobility? Yes, indeed. So blue box, uh, a product of, of NXP, uh, NXP being a semiconductor uh, company, uh, basically designing, manufacturing and selling chips for the automotive industry. So looking towards the future of you know, next generation advanced driver assistance systems all the way towards highly automated driving, these chips, that hardware inside the car needs to, uh, uh, needs to innovate. And that is exactly what we're doing together with NXP. And Blue Box is their kind of R&D platform. It's kind of the brains of the car of the future. And what we do together with them is to make sure that that the box uh, that the brains of the car of the future meet the requirements of the future and that's what we do in our research lines here and who's going to set the requirements for the future is, is it the insurance companies is it government it it, it will be uh, coming from from multiple uh, from multiple stakeholders and and you, you just mentioned a few but the first thing is to to technically realize uh, 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 these innovations of course, uh, you know, uh, there has been a big hype on, on highly automated driving, but if you need to bring that technology to the road safely all over the world, that's a completely different ball game. And how far are we uh, at the moment? How far are we uh, to get to the, uh, the self-driving car? It's still a long way off, isn't it? it, it it's definitely still a long way off. Uh, you are absolutely right in that. If you, if you consider this self-driving car, you know, I get in my car in Amsterdam, I say, hey, go to Milan, go to Paris, and you know, it's raining, it's snowing along the way, and I arrive there, and in the meantime, I watched the video and, and I took a nap. That is definitely very far off. But an autonom autonomous taxi that maybe only drives from the uh, train station to the airport, and maybe also from the train station to another train station or to a campus, you know, with, let's say, limited possibilities where this vehicle can drive, I think that is realistic to, to have in, in, in five to 10 years from now. And I noticed that in when you see all these pictures, uh, especially from Google doing the self-driving car, they're always on a highway. It's yeah. always ideal uh, conditions yeah. somewhere in California. Yeah. I think you probably have an advantage at the Eindhoven University of Technology in that your campus is very similar to an urban city. Yeah, so indeed, so we focus our research mainly on in the urban context because, yeah, you know, the industry is, is kind of solving the highway scenario. So we are not going to compete with, with industry. It doesn't make sense. So we solve on the, on the most challenging uh, use cases in an urban context. And indeed, our campus here in Eindhoven is kind of an, an urban situation with a lot of pedestrians, a lot of cyclists, not a lot of infrastructure such as 
uh, uh, traffic lights of pedestrian crossings. So yeah, it is very representative of, of the challenging challenges that urban cities here in Europe uh, pose to uh, uh, automated driving. So you mentioned the blue box, and you mentioned that uh, it, it's this giant processor. What are some of the uh, uh, challenges that you're working on uh, connected with this blue box? Let me first highlight, let's say, the, the main research lines that, that we are uh, working on here in the Eindhoven engine. One is advancing radar technology, so making sure that radar uh, sees more, basically. Huh? We also focus on vision technology, making sure that with AI and cameras, the camera can see more. And we're also focusing on the chips inside the blue box to make sure that they, can, they are more power efficient and more powerful. Can, can you show me what these technologies are actually seeing? To a certain extent, I can, I can explain that because in the end, what comes out of the sensors is just only a stream of bits and bytes. So in that video, we see uh, um, how a car localizes itself in the world. We know that GPS systems, they can be very accurate, but they are not robust if you're driving close to buildings or under trees with a lot of leaves. So these vehicles need another source of positioning. And that is LiDAR localization. How does it work? We have a, a point cloud map. Those are all the white points you're seeing in the video. Those are, that, that is a pre-recorded map consisting out of thousands of points. Then the vehicle is driving around and scanning the environment with its LiDAR system. And then it's making a registration of the live uh, LiDAR stream with the map and computing its localization or its location in the map. And that's what you're seeing uh, there in that video. And the color points, those are the live point clouds coming from the LiDAR. And presumably all these sensors in, in the car are generating a huge amount of data. We're talking about petabytes, aren't we? Yeah, for a modern car or a car of the future that will have multiple cameras, multiple radars, maybe even one or two LIDARs. Yeah, it's indeed in the order of petabytes of data. And that all needs to be processed in real time. So you can also imagine that this computer uh, this, this, in, that is inside the car will also have multiple processors. It's not a single processor. It's multiple processors doing lots of pre-processing that in the end goes to either a decentralized or a centralized AI system uh, to make the decisions on basis of all that uh, uh, data. But in terms of most of that data, that's going to be processed in the car, isn't it? Because otherwise uh, you're going to have a huge problem with latency. Yeah, it needs to be processed in the car. You cannot push all the data to the cloud and do the processing there because of latencies and bandwidth limitations. So the cars of the, futures, uh, of the future will definitely be connected. So serving, uh, uh, let's say, more high-level functionality can and probably will run in the cloud. But the, the things that need to run in the car that are related to kind of um, yeah, low latency requirements, safety requirements, they, they need to be processed in the car. But it is important, uh, these vehicles of the future, they will provide tons of data uh, to a cloud system. And the cloud system will create maps out of it. We'll do kind of big data analysis to know okay, what is your fuel consumption? What is the fuel consumption on average on this road? So there will be a huge kind of data data lake uh, uh, in the future with all kinds of mobility data coming from vehicles. Yeah, that, that will be a tremendous resource for either improving safety or efficiency, doing research and all, all those stuff. And yeah, companies like Tesla are already doing this. Eh? They already have this fleet and are crowdsourcing all that data. <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned Tesla, because on the one hand, we hear Elon Musk saying he doesn't think LiDAR has a future in cars, whereas several news sites in the States recently spotted Teslas rigged up with LiDARs, presumably so they can keep track on what it can really do. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So let's say uh, I think it, it was already a year ago that that, that Elon Musk uh, made that statement, and and then here it, with, with with my colleagues we had the notion like, yeah, of course now now these lighters are still too expensive, but in the future they will become you know affordable, just as cheap as radars and and and, and cameras, and then it doesn't make sense to not use lighters because they are a tremendous source of information. Okay, so show us an example where AI plays a role. Yeah, so what you see in this video is uh, the process to create such a map that the, that the vehicle needs in order to localize itself. So that basically involves, in our case, just driving around with the vehicle and then the vehicle is collecting all those LiDAR scans. All those individual LiDAR scans go into a big optimization uh, system, which, called, uh, which is called SLAM or Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. That is then fused with post-processed RTK GPS to create a very accurate point cloud map. 
And that is this white point cloud map that you see in the other video. And once we have this, this point cloud map, uh, the vehicle can drive autonomously in, in that environment. But without this map, it cannot drive autonomously. So the, the, the map is really a key enabler to drive autonomously. Of course, you know, knowing where you are is not enough. You also need to see all the other road users around you. And that's what we do as humans as well. So what we do with uh, our video-based uh, AI analysis is to analyze those video streams and to be able to detect uh, vehicles, pedestrians, but also where is the road, where is the sidewalk, where are trees. Actually, this neural network for each pixel can identify what class it is, up to around 30 different classes. For each pixel, it can say, okay, you belong to car number one, two or three, or pedestrian five, six or, five, six or seven. And inside those objects, it can also distinguish where is the head of the pedestrians, where are the, the hands and the legs and so on, in order to, for another AI system to predict, okay, where is this pedestrian going? Is it going to cross the street, yes or no? Or is this car going to turn left or going to turn right? Now we see systems already that, um... I think BMW has them. They will spot a, a, a pedestrian stepping into the road and immediately apply the brakes. Yeah. So well, uh, are, the, are these systems uh, similar to what you're talking about or is it... Uh... The, the, the goal is similar. Right? The goal is similar. We want to prevent accidents. Now, what is the, the key problem is to predict the future. Predict what other road users will be doing in the future. Because if you can predict that, you can anticipate on that with your own actions. And currently, it's, it's still extremely challenging, for instance, in urban conditions to predict for, for AI what everybody is doing in the future. And we as humans, we are so trained to, to look at our world and to make sense out of it. For us, it's so natural, but for AI, it's so tremendously difficult. So that's also why most uh, uh, kind of collision prevention systems today are uh, reactive. So something is standing in front of the vehicle, I need to break, but not really predictive, not saying, okay, I see this, this object, it, it's not in, in part of my vehicle now, but it will be there in 1.5 seconds from now. What is your preferred future? How do you hope this is going to go forward, let's say in the next five years? So what we hope uh, with the Eindhoven engine is that we can have a lot of follow-up projects. We are already working together with NWO, and that's the organization, our governmental organization that uh, subsidizes research, to already think of uh, a follow-up of, uh, of our Eindhoven engine project. And um, yeah, we, we, will, we are constantly exploring uh, yeah, new opportunities to do research together with our partners. So my future would be here that we have here in the Eindhoven engine building, we have, let's say, a, a team of 10 PhDs and PDNs working on, on yeah, the, the vehicles of the future. But of course, there's a lot of research going on in, in other parts of Europe, too. I'm thinking of Munich and the, the huge uh, uh, auto companies, too. Where does Eindhoven fit in and how can you really compete with uh, what other, others are doing? Yeah, that, that is a very important question, because if you consider all those investments all over the world in this in this field, hey, how are you going to compete with a relatively small university and then a relatively kind of eh, in the bigger scale, small lab? Um, the, the answer to that question is focus, focus, focus. Huh? So and cooperate. So together with our international partners, we have discussions also with the German OEMs and the German peers. So this is where we are going to focus on, this is what you are doing, and this is how we are, how we are going to bring it together uh, uh, in, in this uh, European project settings. So guys, if people are watching this uh, and interested in getting involved with what you're doing, uh, what should they do? Yes, please do uh, reach out to me uh, via email or via my LinkedIn, and we're happy to do uh, 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 demos. We used to do tons of demos before COVID, almost weekly, and we hope we can do all those demos again after this situation has cleared. Well, thank you very much indeed for being part of Dutch Technology Week. Thanks to you, Jonathan.